Welcome back, I'm Jeffrey Brown, we're here in Chicago at McCormick Place at Book Expo America, and I'm joined now by Faith Saley, whose new book, first book, yes. is Approval Junkie, Adventures in Caring Too Much. That's a provocative title. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> what, what is an approval junkie? Um, well, I'd say I'm at least a recovering approval junkie. I think it's someone... Oh, you're recovering. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know, you know, because the I stories here that you're writing about are in, in approval junkie mode almost, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, it's essays of things I've done throughout my life and my evolving relationship with seeking approval. I mean, I, I think an approval junkie is someone who is honest and human enough to admit that applause or a uh -huh. high five or laughter feels good. Yeah. And, and I think it's a fundamental, you know, human need. Yeah. Um, I would not say an approval junkie is, you know, a people pleaser because that can sort of condemn you to mediocrity, trying to please everybody. I, I think it's someone who's willing to take a risk and maybe even embarrass himself or herself uh -huh. in, in an effort to create something new or hilarious or compelling. And, and, and were you always this way? I kind of, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, for better or for worse. And you know, it's not for want of getting an approval as a child, of getting approval as a child. I mean, my mother was relentlessly supportive. So maybe, Maybe that's you know that's uh -huh. what created it. Uh -huh. She she was a woman who would she, she herself would like pray the rosary while doing sit ups. She was she was uh, she was very busy yeah. and very good, yeah. and that was my role model. And yeah. um, I just kind of felt like as a kid, you know, you go through life, you study hard, you make straight A's, you behave well, you keep getting approbation. But if that's sort of your way of going through life, you're probably going to bump into things when you get to adulthood and people stop giving you report cards, yeah. you know? W w w do you remember that moment for you? I mean, was there a specific moment or was it a sort of, it all kind of hit you? You mean when you realize that yeah. like life, you can't make straight A's yeah, all the way yeah, through yeah, life? Yeah, that's what I mean. You know, there was a perfect storm of, uh, of approval junkiness breaking down when I, I left grad school. I had I won a wonderful scholarship and went to grad school to get a master's and I decided, oh, what's next? What should someone with a master's in modern English literature do? And I was like, oh, I know, I'll be a sitcom star. Right. Um, so I moved to LA, thousands of miles away from my family to try this brutal existence as an actor. And at the same time, my mother died. I was in my mid twenties. Mm -hmm. And I was also in a, a relationship with someone whose approval I was constantly seeking. Mm -hmm. And you know, to try try to be an actor, just that in and of itself, you're asking people to choose you over right. and over. Right. And it's so arbitrary. Yeah. So I, I remember thinking, okay, I, I'm out of grad school now. It doesn't matter how many books I read or how much I study. I don't have a mother to tell me I'm wonderful. I have to figure out, and it took a long time, figure out a way to decide whose approval I need and yeah. for what. Yeah. You know, I'm asking you for a definition of, 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 um, of the approval junkie. What about yourself? I mean, you, you're talking about wanting to be an actor, um, you, you journalist, yeah. comedian, writer. How do, you how do you define yourself at this point? Oh gosh, that's such a great question. I, I wish Thank I had you. a pit, yeah, I, no, I wish I had a pit the answer because the more ways you describe yourself, the more likely you are to yeah. sound like a jerk. Yeah. Um, at this point, um, I, I usually start with journalist. Yeah. I mean, most, most of what I do now for CBS Sunday Morning and yeah. even on NPR comes from journalism, even if there's you know, a, a bit of irreverence around it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So in these essays, um, it's high and low, right? I mean, I, I notice you start, you even quote Samuel Beckett at the, at the very beginning, I right? do, fail and again, fail better. Yeah, 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 yeah. But even in your life, it seems like the high levels of sophistication and intellect and all, and then low comedy or low well, whatever. Yeah. I mean, mess, messiness. I yeah, mean. yeah, yeah. I mean, even the high. I mean, I I went from from going to grad school in England to my first success as an actor in, in LA was being in a bikini on Married with Children. So yes, <laughs> it has been it has been a bunch of highs and lows. And and you know, there's a chapter in there about winning my high school pageant. This was public school in the South. Yeah. We had pageants for the girls and how, you know, winning that tiara for singing a Barbara Streisand song in a, in a sequin miniskirt yeah. was a high. Um, but what I really enjoyed about the way I worked with my editor and the way I wanted to tell these stories is that even with some of the silliest or most outre experiences, I think there's, there's something to be mined there. There's a uh -huh. depth. So even, even in the chapter about my high school beauty pageant, which I thought would kind of be my silly Napoleon Dynamite chapter, um, I, my editor urged me to dig deeper and ask questions like why? Like why, 
why do we care what people think about us in high school? Why is it so important to a 17-year-old girl to win a tiara and, and be thought pretty? And, and, and why is it interesting to me to still tell the story of winning the pageant? Yeah. And, and the answer to that in that chapter was I have, I have a wistfulness about that time in my life. I mean, it sounds ridiculous to have been Miss Aphrodite, Goddess of Beauty and Love, <laughs> 1989. But the reason it is wistful, and it goes back to your other question, is like yeah. that was the last time in my life uh, that I think, you know, it's a faith that belongs to the young that you can win something by right. wishing it and working mm -hmm. hard. You, you grow up and you realize there's no harm in working hard, but you don't always get what you want, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. so, so I try, with all these funny, I hope, stories, I try to have some meaningful insight as well. So when did you start writing this, writing it all down? Um, well, I, a lot of it was written in journals during my uh, unhappy first marriage. So I, I had to return to those as you I did. was writing this book. Yeah, yeah. that's and what I'm wondering. I mean, if you were keeping notes as you went along. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, it's funny. I, I have found when I've talked about my book with other people that most people tend to write uh, it, diaries or journals at their most unhappy times. So I would go back to my journals. Well, in some sense, I guess. Right. Yeah. And so I'd look, there were just swaths of, of time where I didn't write anything down because I was happy. And I yeah. went back to the journals and to reread them and, and sort of re-encounter the, the depths of my struggles was a, was a tough experience. Yeah, what was that like? Um, it, it's amazing how much we forget. We're very, I think we're made to be so resilient. When I was reading, I mean, I decided to write the book at a point in my life where I had so many wonderful questions answered. Like, will I ever find love again? Yes. Will I become a mother? Yes. I became a mother in my 40s. Will I find the right career? Yes. Mm. Where will I live? And, and so to return to my journals of when times were so hard and to read the like verbatim the things mm -hmm. that I had written down, the arguments I had had with my ex-husband, it was as if reading about another character from long, long ago. Oh, you was, were able to separate yourself. You felt separate. I did yeah. because I'm so, yeah. because my perspective now is so happy and mm -hmm. grateful that it was mm -hmm. like, oh, I forgot that happened. I forgot I said that. I forgot that happened to me. Um, and I guess one obvious question is why dredge it up again, right? <laughs> I think that, well, yeah. You, you've you've well, gotten past it. You're happy. <laughs> you know, I really. Why explore all that? Oh, my I, goodness. I <laughs> really hope that in sharing these stories, and by the way, m most of this book is also very, I, I hope, very funny, yes. right? We should say right, that. Right, we don't right. want to get the impression that it's all, you know, right, it's, it is very funny. I, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and But I hope also meaningful. And yeah. so, you know, I, I did think it was worth dredging it yeah. up because um, I think I think the funny and the word, sad. I, think, right? <laughs> I, I agree. The funny and the sad in life so often bump up against each other. Yeah. And, yeah. and what has been so gratifying, my book just came out, is I'm hearing from people who picked it up because they thought it would make them laugh, but it inspired them. Yeah. You know, my struggles about after losing my mother to become a mother in my 40s. And, and yes, there's a lot of humor in that. But, um, but, but I think, you know, I, I think that the sort of miracle of, of writing honestly is that the more specific and personal your stories are, the more chance you have to have them resonate mm -hmm. universally. Because mm -hmm. I just think people are drawn to like a, a true story and honesty and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope. What about the writing itself? Did that come easily? It was very hard. It was yeah. very hard yeah. logistically. It wasn't hard for me to express myself. I kind of do that for a living. That's what hard. I was thinking, because you're used to I, communicating totally. in another way. Right? Yes, and I probably yeah. say too much all the time. Yeah. What was hard was I started writing this right before I gave birth to my second child. And I wrote this while I had a toddler and a newborn, and I was breastfeeding 16 times a day in between trying to write this. It was it was hard to have, I didn't have a desk in our apartment. I mean, it was, so it was a logistical challenge yeah, to yeah. try to collect my thoughts through the sleep deprivation. Yeah. And what ended up coming out first was what I called a vomit draft. It was just, here's here's everything going through my mind. And that's why we are so lucky as authors to have editors, yeah, yeah, to yeah. have it filtered and turned into something that, you know, wasn't a big mess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, so, so once you got to that, the vomit draft. <laughs> Yes, sorry. Yes. But, then, but then it all came together. I mean, you yeah. saw that you had not just essay by essay, but you had a whole. I had a whole. Yeah. And I could see the, you know, there's an implicit arc. This is not a memoir per se. These are yeah. essays yeah. thinking about I mean, approval. it sort of adds up to one in it a does. sense, right? It does. Yeah. It was an arc yeah. in my life about yeah. how I have learned yeah. that seeking approval, I still seek approval. Yeah. Um, but I learned why and when it matters. So I love getting approval from my colleagues because I work on shows that I care about and I work with people who inspire me. I love getting approval from my husband because, well, he unconditionally loves me. But I really decided ab ab about which things I should seek my own approval. Mm -hmm. and, and that was sort of, and at the end of the book, I read a letter to my daughter 
um, who's only two, but I do think women struggle with approval more than yeah. men. Yeah. Um, and, and it felt like a nice finish to try to tell her mm -hmm. what I've learned. What about audience or, or readership? I mean, do you think about it differently when you're putting it down? Did you even think about the readers as it, opposed to I the did. journalism or the on stage? Or, I did think about yeah. the readers and I thought, I, I always sort of pictured in my mind th th what, I, what I would have told myself in maybe my mid-30s if I had known about all the way, all, the evolution I would, I would reach and the happy endings I would have. I kind of thought about a woman in her mid-30s with all these big questions yeah. to answer. But what has made me very pleasantly surprised is that the feedback I get from readers is that it's resonated with women of all ages, but also men. I've had wonderful interviews with men. I mean, seeking or admitting to seeking mm -hmm. universal, uh, 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 seeking approval is universal. You mm -hmm. know, everybody likes to be validated. Yeah. So, um, so that's been a pleasant surprise. And and just in our last minute here, because did you say this was your first yeah. um, book? So what's, I, I, I've been to a few, and I'm, I, but every time I'm kind of amazed by the, just how much there is to it. I know. So I'm wondering about your first impression. I'm walking around here and I have two reactions. One is it's, as a first time author, you of course want your book to be a bestseller. Yeah. And you sort of get perspective, oh my gosh, there are so many books in the world. Right. I'm lucky anybody ever wants to read mine. Right. But on the other hand, it's also so inspiring that there are this many books, that, that, that clearly there is a need for them. Clearly there are people in this world thirsty and hungry for yeah. new ideas and yeah. to connect through words. It's yeah. so gratifying. So you're going to keep writing? So what? Are you going to keep writing? Oh, yes, I'm going to keep writing. But I, I think I need to write a children's book. I can't believe how many are around here. I can't, I can't, keep, bingo, I can't stop bingo, putting right? them down. <laughs> All right, Approval Junkie, Adventures in Caring Too Much, Faith Saley. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Jeffrey.